Hello, my name is Kate and in this presentation we'll be looking at some of the research I am undertaking at the University of Bristol where I'm looking at using a light to make medicinal compounds. But before we have a look at my research, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my background and why I chose to do chemistry. So I grew up just outside of Oxford and for my A-levels I chose to do maths, chemistry and biology for two years and French for just one year. And since I enjoyed chemistry, I decided to continue with that at university and I managed to get the grades to get into the University of Bath to study a four year degree called MChem Chemistry for Drug Discovery with Industrial Placement. So for the first two years of that degree, I was based at the University of Bath where I went to lectures and learnt practical chemistry skills in the lab classes. Then for my third year I undertook an industrial placement with the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca and I was based in Audley Edge which is up near Manchester. During that time I worked in the isotope chemistry group where we labelled compounds with isotopes such as carbon-13 and deuterium to make them more useful in analysis. Then for my final year I was back at the University of Bath to continue my studies and to undertake a research project where I looked at making compounds found in nature that might be useful as medicinal compounds. But when I finished my undergraduate degree, I had to decide what I wanted to do next. So I decided to undertake a graduate scheme once again with the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. But this time I was based in Gothenburg in Sweden or Jotobori as it is in Swedish. Now at the moment, AstraZeneca is mostly known for vaccines, but usually its research focuses on ma three main therapeutic areas. One is cardiovascular, metabolic and renal disease, and they put that in one department called CVMD. They also look at respiratory diseases and oncology. But in Sweden, they mostly focus on CVMD and respiratory. And during my time there, I worked in both of those departments. And I worked as both a synthetic chemist and an analytical chemist. So synthetic chemists tend to be based in the lab and they're mixing chemicals together to try and make new medicinal compounds. And I worked as both a traditional synthetic chemist, making what we call small molecules, but I also worked making peptides. And an analytical chemist mostly analyzes compounds that other chemists have made to make sure they have made the right thing. Now, once I had finished my two year grad scheme, I had to decide what I wanted to do next. So I decided to do a PhD. And I came back to the UK. To the University of Bristol. Where I am a part of the Bristol Chemical Synthesis Centre for Doctoral Training. And I'm currently investigating chemical reactions where I want to use a light to make new medicinal compounds. But why did I choose chemistry in the first place? 
Well, there are two main reasons. One of those reasons is I liked that chemistry was both a theoretical and a practical subject. So what I mean by that is you can read about the chemistry in a textbook and then you can go and try out the chemistry for yourself to make sure they are telling you the truth. And a nice example of this is something called the flame test, which you may have undertaken as part of your A-levels. And what the textbook will tell you is if you burn something containing lithium cations, you should get a crimson flame. You can then go and test that out for yourself by taking some lithium chloride, sticking it in a Bunsen burner, and hopefully you will see that crimson flame. But I also liked chemistry because it is useful in society. It is all around us. You can find chemistry in renewable energy, in your mobile phone, and in the medicines you take when you're unwell to help you get better. But chemistry also helps you develop a whole range of other skills, such as problem solving, teamwork, innovation, research, analytical skills, risk assessment, communication, time management, organisation and creativity. And all of these skills can be useful in different areas of life as well. So that's just a little bit about my background and why I chose to do chemistry. So let's have a look at some of the research I've been undertaking at the University of Bristol. So my research is mostly interested in making new compounds in e that could be used as medicines. Now here are some medicines that you may be familiar with and may have used yourself, such as paracetamol. And I have included both the display structure, which you may be more familiar with at A-level, but I've also included the skeletal structure, which we tend to use from A-levels onwards. I'm just going to talk through this because it might be a fairly new concept to some of you. So with skeletal structures, basically at every bend or corner, there is a carbon. And we know that carbon should be bonded to four other atoms. So if we have a look at the carbon at the top, we can see that has one, two, three bonds. So we know that it must have a hydrogen attached to it as well, so that we have that fourth and final bond. Now, as well as paracetamol, you may be familiar with compounds such as ibuprofen. And this structure at the bottom here is one of the medicinal compounds that you find in Lemsip, which you may have taken if you have a cold or a flu. But why are we interested in making new compounds for uses in medicines? And in an attempt to answer that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the drug discovery process. So how this tends to work is there tends to be a medicinal chemist based in industry. So they tend to be working for a pharmaceutical company and they want to make a new medicine for heart disease. And they know that to treat heart disease, they have to make a compound that is a particular shape that will fit into the target found within the heart. And once they know the shape of the compound to fit into that target, they then go and have a look at what I've termed medicinal chemistry 
toolbox to see if anyone has made a compound of that shape before. And if they find that nobody has made a compound of that shape before, they have to spend months figuring out how to make a compound that will fit into that target in the body. Whereas if they find that some useful PhD student such as myself has already figured out how to make a molecule that will fit the target, it will save them both time and money. But why do we want to save time within the drug discovery process? Well, the main reason is that it takes quite a long time to make new medicines. It takes about 13 years and it costs about 1.8 billion or 1.4 billion dollars just to make one new medicine. So if we can help to reduce that time, that means we can get important medicines to people who need it a little bit quicker and that can only be a good thing. So in my research, we're not only interested in making new compounds for use in medicines, but we're interested in making them in a particular way. We want to use light to make those compounds, and that is called photochemistry. Now, unfortunately, this does not mean I spend all day taking pictures of chemistry. If we have a look at the word photochemistry, we can see that photo actually means light. And you may have come across this before in words such as photosynthesis. And if we are to bring down photosynthesis we find that photo means light and synthesis means putting together. So for photochemistry that means we are using a light to carry out chemical reactions. But why do we want to use light to carry out chemical reactions? Well there are two main reasons. One is photochemistry can produce less waste than traditional chemistry. So if we look at the reaction at the top, you see that we get a product shown by the green circle and the yellow square, but we also generate waste as well. Whereas with photochemistry, we can take two compounds, irradiate them with light and just get product. We're also interested in using photochemistry because it can produce compounds that we can't make using traditional chemistry. So, for example, if we wanted to try and react these two triangles together using traditional chemistry, it wouldn't be possible. Whereas if we irradiate them with light, we get the product we are interested in. So let's have a look at some of the actual structures that I am trying to make. So here I have both the display structure and the skeletal structure. And as you can see, the compounds we're interested in contain quite a few different functional groups, some of which you will be familiar with and some of which you will learn about later. So this molecule contains some alkanes, an alkene, an amine as well as an aromatic ring, a ketone and an amide. But how do we make this molecule using light? Well, we don't make all of the structure using light, we just make the part highlighted in red. And to do that, we start off with this molecule here, irradiate that with light, and it rearranges itself to give us the structure we're interested in. Now, unfortunately, I can't just buy this starting material. I have to make it in a few reaction steps from this compound here, which we can buy. Now, just to put chemistry into context, if you were to buy a kilogram of sugar 
from your local supermarket, that would cost you 65p for one kilogram. Whereas if you were to buy a kilogram of this compound here, that would cost you £4,210. But thankfully, we don't tend to use a kilogram of that compound, and that doesn't come out of my own pocket. Now, as well as being a photochemical reaction, this reaction is also an in intramolecular reaction. But what does that actually mean? While most chemical reactions that you will be familiar with are intermolecular reactions, and those are reactions between two or more compounds. Intramolecular reactions, however, the compound reacts with itself to give a new structure. So if we have a look at the reaction I'm interested in, we can see that both the starting material and the product contain the red carbon and the blue nitrogen. But in the product in between that red carbon and the blue nitrogen is the pink carbon and the green carbon. And what you find with intramolecular reactions is actually we have the same number of elements in both the starting material and the product. So they both have nine carbons, nine hydrogens, two oxygens, one nitrogen and two chlorines. Now this means that this reaction has 100% atom economy. And that means that this reaction has less waste. Now, before I finish, I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the hazards associated with photochemistry. And the main hazard is the light that we use which through most of this presentation has been represented by that blue light bulb. But what that actually looks like in real life is this bright blue light here. And that light is actually ultraviolet light, also known as UV light. Now you may have heard of UV light before in relation to the sun. And the sun lets out UV light and that is what causes damage to our eyes and skin. And the way we protect ourselves against that UV light is by covering up, wearing sun cream and wearing our sunglasses. And the way we protect ourselves against the UV light in the lab is fairly similar. We protect our skin by wearing lab coats and gloves. And we protect our eyes by covering up that UV light and by wearing dark glasses. So, just to summarise this presentation, in my research, I'm interested in making new compounds that could be used as medicines because if we can reduce the time it takes to make those new medicines, we can get them to patients quicker. I'm interested in using photochemistry to make these compounds because it produces less waste than traditional chemistry and you can make compounds that you can't make with traditional chemistry. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Do you have any questions?